Liam. We have to respect it. Me sumo a las disculpas de Richard en tema de nuestro retraso. Mr. Bravo, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, Costa del Sol, sorry. Yeah. I've been to Costa Brava. Been there. Anyway, we did that, we had a wonderful time. But we are at the, the organization of the festival. We're very intrigued of your main destination, Gibraltar. You just said to us, what do you want, why do you want to go to Gibraltar? Well, I think you, you, you I don't know why I wanted to go. <laughs> I, I, it, it was just completely enticing to me to go there. I, I think it was that um, it is this collision of basically two cultures, for one thing, and it's also, of course, geographically significant and geographically momentous in a way. Mm -hmm. um, one wants to see it, and it's also where the Atlantic meets the Mediterranean culture. So for us, it was, it was enough that we wanted to go We didn't know. We didn't have to know why we wanted to go. Yeah. We, we thought we would find out why we wanted to go when we got there. <laughs> I mean, if you, I mean, if you always want to know, you know, if you always know where you're going, if you always know why you want to go someplace, you'll never surprise yourself. And you said to me that one of the main surprises of Gibraltar was that Gibraltar is sort of a no place, right? Well, <clears throat> I don't think the people who live in Gibraltar think that. <laughs> uh, but for us, it was, uh, it, it seemed to me to be a place where someone would go if she or he were wishing to hide from the world. So in other words, it seemed like a natural place to set a novel. Not that I intend to set mm -hmm. a novel there, but it was sort of, you know, <clears throat> Um, between two worlds, really, yeah. and, and, and a place that isn't really properly defined by either world. Um, I mean, there are these places where people can go and, and, and just take refuge yeah. and go and not be recognized and know and not have to worry about fitting in. And so that, that seemed to me to be such a place. Yeah, and you said to me that this, this kind of places really amazes you or intrigue you. Always. They, they, they always in, in, in intrigue me. I mean, um, I mean, I'm at this book that I'm about to publish in, in, in Spain in the spring is, is part of it is set in Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. which is also it's an American monument, one of the most ridiculous <laughs> in, that, that, that there are. But but it, it draws you. It, it, something in it draws you, even if you don't know what the reason is for it to draw you. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, being being a novelist. <clears throat> If I already had language for these things, I probably wouldn't want to go. But I go and then I find language for it. I, I try to give um, uh, language space to, and language shape to something that I only have feelings for. Uh, so, I mean, that's, I think, probably everybody, painters and, and sculptors, Uh, they, they don't necessarily have an idea. What they have is sensation. And so I'm lucky enough to think that if I have strong sensation for something, I can go there and give, it, give that sensation some, mm -hmm. some address. Yeah. For instance, this idea, this idea reminds me of Fort Royal, <clears throat> the place where the second part of Canada took place. Yes. You know, nobody's from there, everybody's passing, everybody's hiding from something. Um, tell, tell us uh, a little bit about the construction of this no place of your own. You mean in Canada? In Canada, yeah. Well, it can, it, I, don't know, I don't know how many here of you can imagine what the prairie provinces of Saskatchewan look like. Uh, <laughs> Well, they, they, they look like the steppes in Russia. It, it, it's covered in wheat. Uh, you won't say it's completely flat because it, it's a prairie. So it, 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 it rolls like that. But it's also um, geographically a desert, which is to say it has a, a suffic sufficiently little water falling out of the sky to be a desert. And yet it is also rich and cultivatable. And, uh, and out in these places, there are just these little hamlets, which are m largely on the railroad line. But in the 20th century, going into the 21st century, people just moved away. People, they, people just couldn't sustain life there. And yeah. 
big companies bought small farms, and so it's what in the United States is called agribiz. It's agricultural business, huge farms, very few people living on them. But there are these little vestigial uh, hamlets left. And so I was just naturally drawn to uh, set something there because Christina and I used to go sh shooting geese there years ago. Mm. And uh, there are all these wonderful old hotels which are still in existence. And they, they are, they're more like rooming houses than they are hotels. But, 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 they're, but they're quite atmospheric. And, um, and they still exist. And uh, so I wanted, you know, most of the way that novels get written, at least by me, is that, is that I find something that I want to stick in a book. So I want to stick this hotel in a book yeah. and see what I can make happen there. It isn't really a design so much. It's just that I see something. You know, I, I, I take something uh, out of my notebook that I definitely want, that I definitely have been interested in, and then I just slam it in a book. And when I put it in a book, then I have to make something happen there. Uh, it's not so much by design as it is just opportunistic. Mm. But this is an idea that connects uh, several of your, of your works. I'm th thinking about Canada, but also Rock Springs, that there are certain places, mostly in deep America, where everybody's passing, even the ones who born there, mm, like if these places are cursed or have a burden, and the people who live there have to carry that burden. Well, you know, more that may be true, and that just may be how I make things happen. But um, you choose Rock Springs, or you choose Saskatchewan, or you choose even Paris, where I have set lots of stories, because you can make anything happen there that's plausible. You, I mean, I, I once set a story in the middle of Grand Central Station in New yeah. York City, and I set it there because I could make anything I wanted to happen there. I mean, that's the great thing about where you set the story, what the mise-en-scene is for your story. It accommodates you to put anything there that you want to, and the reader can think to herself or himself, yes, 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 I, I understand that. Mm. And if you can make the background plausible, then you can make what happens in the foreground plausible. Some critics said that you are uh, one of the greatest um, uh, writers about the B-side of the American dream. Do you agree with them? No. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> what, do you, what, is that, what does that mean, the B-side of the American dream? I mean, the American oh, dream see. is this dream of success, uh, you know, oh. and the other side is not that I'm successful. glad I don't read those things. Uh, well, they, they would only... Would, Just make me angry. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think there's an A and a B side to life. You know, I just think there's life, and it's 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 yeah. That's why, you know, what is it? Susan Sontag said, uh, "Interpretation is the is the compliment that mediocrity plays to genius." So um, <laughs> you agree? So well, I don't know that I agree, but it just comes to mind. Uh. Okay, <laughs> let me come back to the idea of no places. I wonder if your fascination with them starts in your childhood when you live in the no place par excellence. I mean, yeah. the hotel of your grandfather in Little Rock. Yes, and, and, and in a lot of other hotels too. My, my family was, was a family that moved around, <laughs> uh, which is to say my father was what in the U.S. is called a traveling salesman. And in his car, he drove seven southern states and stayed in hotels every night. And many times he took me. And then when he died, I was made to go live with my grandparents. And they ran a huge hotel. As, you, know, you were 12, I think? I was 16. 16. I was okay. 16. And um, had 600 rooms. I was just, the, I, I was the manager's grandson. So I was free to do anything I wanted to do, and did. <laughs> <laughs> But this so that was just great. You, you, you have an essay about it, and you uh, portrait like it was a place where the whole human experience passes. Oh, yes, yes. 
and, and, my, and my grandfather made me certain to see that crossroads of humanity. I mean, he, he, I remember one time, more than one time, him waking me up in the middle of the night and saying, Dick, come with me. And he would take me downstairs and to some room where some man had committed suicide. Oh. Something he wanted me to see. Oh, yeah. And uh, sometimes he would take me places where the wrong person was in the wrong room with the wrong person. And he, I was there for that. And uh, so I... <laughs> and, and he also made me be a room, room service waiter. Uh, and if you want to see the world, you really have to be a room service waiter because, you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning, you're bringing breakfast for somebody, and the door opens, and there these people are. So uh, <laughs> for me, it was, I don't know, it was rich. It was uh, unexpected. It was surprising. It was delightful. It was uh, scary. It was everything. Maybe the greatest place uh, for a novelist to grow? It wouldn't be bad. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be bad because, you, yeah, I mean, you, you know, hotels are places where people come to do things that they don't want other people to know about. And uh, at least that's the way I saw them. So it made me think that most people have things in their lives that they don't want other people to know about. And if, and if, you, th and if you think about what is a good premise for a novel or a premise for a play or a premise for a poem... Write about someone's shameful secret. Mm. But hotels are also places of loneliness. For you it was, I think. No, I was never lonely there. No? I, was, I was solitary yeah. there very much. But I was never lonely. Because you don't have friends there. You don't even have neighbors. No. But that, doesn't, that isn't necessarily the formula for loneliness. Mm. Um, I had all of my grandfather's employees. And I had my grandmother, and I had my grandfather, and they loved me. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I didn't have anybody who was my age there, I was aware of that, and I wish that I had, but I didn't. So what that made me be, and I think this is good too for me, was I was very curious about what adults were doing. Mm. Uh, I was very curious from the standpoint of a 16, 17, 15-year-old boy, what was adult life? What did adults care about? What did they have that were secrets? What did they hear? What did they know? Mm. And that's also not bad, bad, training, bad training for a, uh, a novelist. I, I remember when I was t teaching at Harvard, I, um, I, I would go to my office in Harvard and, because you were supposed to go to your office because the students would come and talk to you. Well, the students never came and talked to me, and I didn't know why. And it was the winter of 1994, and it was very cold, and I was driving in from the suburbs, and I would drive in in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon, and no one shows up. So I finally asked one of my students. I said, I, I go, I sit in my desk waiting for you. Why, why don't you come? And he said, well, he, he said, this is a very smart kid. He said, well, you know, We don't know very much about adults. Mm -hmm. He said, we were raised with, to have play dates. And we were raised to always be around our friends and our contemporaries. And our parents went off. To, they both worked. They were never around. So the only thing we knew about was each other. And I thought, oh, God, how horrible. <laughs> Because, I mean, wouldn't you be curious if you were a child to know what adults were doing? Because they, they have all the power. They make all the decisions. So I, I was lucky in that way. I didn't have any friends. Um, still don't have very many. Um, but being a, novel, <laughs> being a novelist tends to kind of cut you off. <laughs> but you need to fill uh, some time with your imagination, I think, or not? Well, I have, you have to do something if you're not doing something. Of course. <laughs> I mean, even, even to fill with imagination, uh, pieces of conversation you heard. Yeah. That's the beginning of the, this Some, essay. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. You know, Henry David Thoreau says, a writer is a person who, having nothing to do, finds something to do. <laughs> and, and that's basically what I do with those little snippets of conversation that my notebook is full of. I, 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 I take those things really seriously. 
uh, because they are the, they're what I have. Um, they're, they're what I pick up. They're what I uh, am interested in. Mm. I mean, not having contemporaries all the time uh, made things that would otherwise be unnoticeable noticeable to me. Mm. And it's curious because uh, and in Malaga you uh, tell us that you were dyslexic yes. and, and learned to read in your 20s, right? Um, well, read, read in a serious way. In a serious way. I, I could read when I was eight, but I was really bad, and I was really slow, mm. and I, and I could, couldn't read silently. I moved my lips when I read, all that kind of thing. But, but I wonder what happens when those two elements, imagination and serious reading, get together. <clears throat> well, and, I, and, of course, writing. Um, well, in my case... Uh, because I was such a slow reader, and I'm still a slow reader, um, aspects of language that would be otherwise not noticeable to an ordinary good reader became noticeable to me, which is to say what words look like, how long they were, mm. how many syllables they had, how many of this sound, how many of that sound, how many, uh, what, what, what the syncopation of the syllables was. And, and, and that is an aspect of language that is to me as important as what a word means, how it looks, how it sounds, how you say it in your mouth. So um, that for me was, was one of the ways in which I wrote sentences. Mm. I wrote sentences, as I still do, listening to them. By its sound. Yeah, listening yeah. to them, listening to the number of A's, number of use the number of O's and how many syllables and where the emphasis in a syllable lies, that turns out to be as important to me that's as anything you, else. That's why you call your style. Oh, no, that's just my way of doing things. I don't call my style, any, I, I don't call my style anything because cause I don't want one. Hmm. You know, uh, there's a wonderful line of Renzo Pianos, and he's the great architect. He says, style is good, but it can be a, it can be a golden ceiling. Hmm. And, and, and what he means by that, and, 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 uh, what he means by that is, that is that you can begin to imitate yourself if you, if you have a hard and fixed style. So for me, always, I'm trying to put the style of the last book behind me and make something new be out of language that I haven't heard before. Because then I can actually write something that's new for myself. Whereas if I'm imitating myself, I'm always trying to use the model of the last book yeah. for what I'm doing now. So I try not to think about uh, developing a style. I think a lot of young writers, a lot of young writers are misled when they are told. And I heard Joyce say this yesterday, and I disagree with Joyce Carol Oates. She said, she said, all writers have to develop their voice. And I thought, well, that's not really true. I thought you have to have lots of voices. Because mm. we all of us, everybody in this room, has in her or his mind different ways of addressing the world. You talk to your priest in one voice. You talk to your uh, hair, hair cutter in another voice. You talk to your you know, psychotherapist in another voice. And so we all have those different voices. I have uses for those voices. And I like, I like it that I don't always talk the same way and sound the same way. So you get the chance to match the style and the content of a book. Well, that assumes that each has an existence before I start, and they don't. So the style becomes the, the content. And the content becomes the style. It isn't a matter of, of filling up a vessel, which is your style, with the content. One, one or I don't want to say organically, but one rather mysteriously breeds off the other. Yeah, sure. Yeah. In Malaga, you talk with Juan Gabriel Vázquez and Eduardo Lago about your first steps as a writer and the influence of two fundamental American writers, Faulkner and Hemingway. Yes. But let me ask you about another writer, some of them really close to you, whose influence or friendship also are or were important to you. Uh, the first is Chekhov, yes. from whom you make a selection with a splendid prologue. 
Oh, good. Oh, thank you. I love that prologue. Um, because I, uh, I wrote, a, I did a little anthology of Chekhov's stories and wrote the introduction. And um, it, it allowed me to say about Chekhov what I, dis what I felt about Chekhov when I first read him when I was in my early 20s, which was that I didn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't understand why any of this was important at all. But I was being told by my teachers, this is the greatest short story writer of the 19th century. And I thought, why? Why? <laughs> so I, so I, 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 I made myself comfortable in the presence of things I didn't understand. And that's one of the things that great literature can do for any reader, because it isn't always going to be available to you, particularly when you're young. I mean, there's certainly lots of books that people are too young to read. I mean, I don't think I'm quite old enough yet to read Henry James. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm 80 years old. But, but I know, what, hmm? <laughs> but I know when I first read Chekhov that I was too young to read it, but I read it. And I experienced as much of it as I possibly could. And, and it let me know that this is a little bit like what we began talking about when we were talking about going to, uh, going to the rock, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I knew I was in the presence of something consequential because I could feel it when I was reading Chekhov. And, and <coughs> over the years, I kept reading and reading and reading and reading, and finally I came to the conclusion of, oh, oh yes, I mean, the guns aren't going to go off. You know, the cavalry's not going to come over the hill. But something between human beings of consequence has happened. And we don't know. We, we, if we were watching it, if we were in the room with these people, we wouldn't know what it was. But the story allows us patiently and carefully to go through these human enterprises. And, and, and the story, by virtue of being a story, says to you, this is important. Trust me, this is important, even if you can't see what it is. Mm. Another Chekhovian writer such as Raymond Carver. Yeah. Well, Carver was my buddy. And, and, and I, I, I loved his stories. Uh, and I was writing novels, and he was writing stories. And, and it was great. And, um, and I wasn't a very good short story writer. Had never really thought that I was any good at it. But when I got around Carver, and it was true of some other writers too, and Beattie, uh, Toby Wolf, Tobias Wolf, mm. uh, Tim O'Brien, uh, Joy Williams, lots of uh, people that, who were my contemporaries and my friends, I, I realized that they were writing these short stories and they made it look easy. And moreover, the stories weren't very long and it didn't take you very long to write them. <laughs> and I thought, oh, and they were also, by the way, going around the country in the United States in the 80s giving readings and being loved and adored and, and sometimes being paid money. <laughs> and I thought, I'm missing out on something writing these big, long novels. I said, I, I really need to learn how to write stories so that I can go around and give readings and be adored. And, and, and so I, that's why I did it. And, and, and so I thought, well, if you can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so I did it. I, I still don't think I'm as good at it as he was. But I, I, he was such a lovely man and a sweet guy that uh, it, was, it was nice. He got, he got very famous pretty fast in the United States. And I was his buddy. And I wasn't famous. And, and so, but I hung around with him, and we, we did things together. And he made being famous seem really human. His ascendance to uh, notoriety didn't cut him off from his friends. And I thought that's a really nice lesson, nice lesson to remember. Yeah. So, that's, so you know, you think to yourself, was he an influence on me? Yes, but in these ways. Yeah. Not so much in the ways of whether I write a sentence like him or not write a and sentence. And the way like you him. make that uh, um, crucial uh, question, why not, right? Become a writer? Yes, right, exactly. Why not? Why, why become a writer? Uh, well, I, I, I became a writer because I wasn't any really good at anything else. <laughs> I mean, um, I, had, I had been to law school and I had been in the Marine Corps briefly and I'd been a teacher and I had um, 
I worked on the railroad. I had worked in hotels. I'd, I'd done a lot of things by the time I was 23 years old. And none of them had worked out for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Christina and I were about to get married. And, and so um, I thought, well, I have to say I'm going to be something. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I asked her, I said, do you think it's, what do you think? I said, uh, do you think it, if I said I was going to be a writer, it'd be okay? She said, oh, great. She said, that's a really good idea. She said, uh, she, you know, uh, I'll, she, she said, I'll, she wanted to go to work. And so I thought, okay, you go to work. And she said, and she said, you, she said, you stay home and write stories and I'll get a job. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem very conventional, but I'll try it. <laughs> another name, uh, another name. Yesterday we have in Malaga and also uh, here, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, yeah. we, which is also your buddy. She is. She is. She is. She is my buddy. She's just. She's like my sister. Yeah. And yesterday she told a really surprising story. You didn't even know it. Did. I think she may have made it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, she told a story. She, she told a story when Raúl was in, was interviewing her, in which she she talked about me taking her to a boxing match in Madison Square Garden in New York, and that it had been such a memorable experience for her that she decided she would write about boxing. Yeah. And, that she, and then she wrote this quite excellent book, nonfiction On boxing. book, yeah. called On Boxing. And she, and she credited me with being the, the, the sort of uh, fulcrum point of her deciding to write this book. I, you no, know, I had never heard that story before. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that story only arrived yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> But she was, you know, she was, she was trying to be nice. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were talking in the bus, and you told me you have an idea for a new book. I'm yeah, not a new story. In there. A new story, anyway. Yeah, but but also describe me your creative process, and it was, you know, not writing only maybe a note, but thinking a bit, uh, processing it, yeah. playing with it. Yeah. Never rushing to the computer. Exactly. Well, I don't write with a computer. I write with a ballpoint pen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, well, I think I'm somebody, for one reason or another, who has a habit of championing his own responses to things. Maybe that comes from being an only child mm -hmm. or from not having any friends when I was little. Uh, none of it was bad. But being an only child was great. I never had to share anything <laughs> with anybody. Um, but I, but I just have a habit of writing something down and thinking I wouldn't have written this down if it were not important. Mm. And then I return to it, and I, by which I mean I go back into my notebook and I read it. And and if it stays, if it still has um, some sort of vibrance to it, there's a line of uh, of Neruda's in which Naruda says the beginning of a poem is algo golpeada in mi alma. Something kicking in my soul. And that's what I feel when I see these, when I see these uh, little things that I, when I write them down, something, a little commotion, a little something kicking me. And if it, and if it keeps on kicking me, then I think to myself, well, okay, I'll see what I can make attached to this it's from something else in my notebook. Now, I'll tell you what my little story is about. My little it's not a story. It's maybe it will be one. I, 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 Christina and I have had a couple of friends, it happens when you get old, who decided that they would end their own lives legally. Because you can do that in the United States. You probably can't do that in Spain. But you probably can't do it in a Catholic country, but you can do it in the United States. But, which, which but we have places in Europe when you, you can yes, do it. Yes, yeah. that place is called Switzerland. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> nice well, place. Of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> What better place to go in your life? Uh, but we had a couple of friends who did that. And uh, it worked out the way they wanted it to. They died. And, um, and it began to seem interesting to me to imagine what sort of experience it would be if someone decided to end his life and ask some of his friends to be attendant, to be present when it, when it took place. 
Now, I don't know if things like this even happen. Typically, I think, when you have a doctor-assisted suicide, your family is there. But I guess you can have whoever you want there. So it occurred to me to have that happen. And then, well, that was basic. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you all of the things because it would put you to sleep. <laughs> but but I, I just thought that is, can be something that happens in this story. I see, I, I imagine a room where someone is in bed and there are people around and some, there's a doctor there who's going to, going to send this guy off to glory and, uh, and, and his friends are there and someone is playing music. And so that's been bubbling around in my brain for about six months and I have a lot of other things hanging on to it now, clinging on to it for dear life. And um, so that, that's kind of how things work. Mm. In the inauguration of Escribidores, you explain your most famous character, Frank Bascomp, as an instrument made by words, with words. Right. And I was wondering if it goes both ways. If sometimes Bascomp gets out of control and sort of use you. No. You're no, always no. in control of him. Oh, I run everything. <laughs> That's what autor means. <laughs> That's what. That's but even what but even Joyce said yesterday that sometimes her uh, stories goes out of his hand. Well, her good, hand. For, good for her. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. No, I run everything. I'm the author. I'm the world's greatest authority on the things that I do. <laughs> so no, Frank never, never, never gets away from me. Um, There, I think there are probably times, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a person who's preoccupied by controlling everything. I mean, that's really what novelists are. They're control freaks. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I am one. And, um, and I think probably I would be a better writer if maybe some things got a little out of my control sometimes and so that I had to accommodate those excursions away. But I, I, I'm so... I'm so disciplined. I'm so every day at my tasks, um, and and that and and I try really uh, hard to draw as many unexpected things into what I do as I can. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm not you know I never for instance ask what would my character do. I ask instead what can I make my character do, and when I think. That way, I think, well, I can make my character do more things than necessarily you might think he would do. So th that's how I try to keep, you know, expanding the space in which the character operates. Mm. Uh, but the space never expands outside my control. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess I grew up thinking, you know, grew up with young writers who were constantly sort of slapping words onto the page and letting things just run away from them and you know, writing big, messy novels that never got published and that nobody ever read. And I just thought to myself, that's, that's just not going to be me. I'm going to finish everything I start. And I'm going to make everything I can be as good as I can possibly make it. And if, if I can do that, maybe it'll, maybe it'll find a reader. Mm. Um, Carver changed the way short stories were written because he thinks that there's no obligation to leave the tension of the story at the end of the story. And he put it anywhere he wanted, at the beginning, in the middle. Uh, I, I feel it's the same with the two first uh, uh, Bascom novels, The Spouse Writer and Independence Day. When you concentrate all the tension in two episodes, which occurred in the middle of these novels, the interview of the sports writer and the moment when Bascom's son gets hit by, by yes. baseball. Yes. Uh, tell me what question that is. <laughs> tell me about the, the, um, this, these moments and, and what, how, how you control the conflict on your novels. That assumes that I do control the conflict in my novels. Um, well, all, all I can say to that is that... Um, I don't think that way. So I don't, the question presumes that I think that way, and I don't. Mm. Um, I'm just always trying to make something important happen all the time. And, and, and it may very well be that I have built into me as a reader 
a sense that the novel has to reach a kind of dramatic end uh, well before it ends, well before the book ends. I mean, that may be just something that comes from my, comes from my reading. Uh, but, the, but the real important thing to me is this. I, I think novels become not very good when they aren't very good in the middle. I, I think novels, anybody can start a novel and anybody can finish a novel. But not everybody can make the middle good. <laughs> and, and so I'm always concentrating on having things be as, be as good in the middle as they're going to be at the end. And so that makes me want to find things in the middle of the book to be, that will we'll say to the reader, come on, come on. This is big things are happening here. It's not just the middle of the book. Hmm. It's actually something of consequence. So, I, so that's really what I'm, what I'm always doing. I mean, in, you know, in, 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 um, in, in writing plays, it's called having second act problems. Um, play, playwrights talk about having second act problems, which is to say in a three act play, you have a great beginning, you have a great end, but what are you going to do with the second act? Well, by God, I'm going to work on that second act really hard. And the third act and the fourth act and the fifth act also. Yeah. Mm. Uh, one final question uh, before the public, uh, and it's personal. In the 19s, I was a young guy who wanted to be a writer, a guy from Lima, Peru, who one day, by a recommendation of a friend, discovered the books of Richard Ford. I read Rock Springs oh, and gee. then the two first Bascom books, Not in order, but first in the that's, right. that's the right order. Oh, yeah. <laughs> out, out of order. And second, the sport writer. And I felt those books were talking to me. A guy from Lima, Peru, with nothing to do with the world of Bascombe or Rock Spring or women with men. And I'd like to ask you the same question I have back then. How is it possible? Well... And it is possible, obviously. I mean, my, my, books yeah, are, my, my books are translated into 35 languages, Chinese, Hebrew, uh, yeah. Farsi, um, which makes me think we must be, all of us, much more alike than we are not alike. And, and literature is the monument, is the institution for that belief, which is that, which is that I can say something to you when we don't speak the same language, but from my heart to your heart, which we have in common. And we all fear things, we all wish for things, we all love things, we all, sometimes we hate things, and that we have that in common. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of the great things about translation, you know. Translation doesn't get enough credit in my world. In my, you know, translators don't get paid very much money. They don't get to travel to the places where the language is that they are translating into. But, but it's through the miracle of translation that, that this becomes possible, that, that you can read in Spanish um, a, a book of mine, or you can read in Farsi a book of mine written in English. Uh, and, and so I, I have a great deal of affection and admiration for translators who, who make this possible. Hmm. Anyone who have a question to Richard for, please. Please. Yes, please. Um, we have a microphone? Un microfono, por favor. Sí. By the way, thank you all. It's raining tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. It's really an honor to get to be here, for Christina and me to come to Seville and do this with you. Sí. Bueno, pues, uh, Richard... Eh, I'm going to translate. Okay. okay. Richard, estoy encantado porque eh, nunca pensé que uno de mis escritores favoritos de la literatura norteamericana, junto con Sha Shepard wait, 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 wait. y Carver... He's thrilled because he never thought that uh, he will meet one of his, uh, the greatest writers of American no well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry he couldn't come. <laughs> one of his favorite writers. <laughs> Y es, estás a dos metros mío. Me siento, two, me siento como un adolescente que tuviera a Taylor Swift. He eh? feels like a child with the Taylor Swift in front of him. <laughs> so, eh, supongo que conocerás que un viajero romántico británico 
que se llamaba Richard Ford. Yeah, um, he assumes you know uh, a British uh, traveler who calls Richard Ford. Estuvo en Andalucía, en Sevilla, en el siglo XIX y escribió. I know, uh, I know he exists. I know he exists through Andalucía. A, tra a travel writer, an English travel writer. Yeah, I know, yeah. I, I know only that he. I thought to myself, I can't read this man. <laughs> 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 so, But I know, the, I know he is. The question is, yeah. estás, no sé si es la primera vez en España, en Sevilla, pero me gustaría saber que un, un escritor de dimensión internacional, si tu visita a Sevilla, Andalucía, te está, te está inspirando mm -hmm. algún argumento para tu próxima novela. So he doesn't know if this is your first time in Spain. It's not your first time he won the Princess of Asturias. Um, and go to Oviedo, but um, he wanted to know if your uh, uh, visit to Andalusia, to Seville, uh, Seville is inspiring you in some, in some sort of way to make a story of it. I'm, I'm feeling something kicking in my soul now, even, <laughs> even, even, even now. Uh, I, I would like to see it when the sun comes up, uh, but I, I think probably yes. But you know, it, it would be so nice It would be so nice to be able to write a story in which the word Sevilla occurs. Um, when, I, when I was writing stories in, in, that were said in Canada, every time I wrote the word Saskatchewan on the page, I felt this kind of wonderful sense of ascendancy. So I'm sure if I could write a story that allowed me to put Sevilla on the page, that I would feel the same sense of gratitude uh, to the language. So, I mean, that's... That's how such things happen. Hmm. Um, I, I wrote a book of stories called Rock Springs many years ago, and I think one of the reasons I wrote it was every time I put Rock Springs on the page, that word, those two words, Rock Springs, I felt ele elevated. So sometimes it's just the language that you use that turns out to be where the story takes place. So yes. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Sí. Eh, buenas. Eh, yo también eh, suscribo la moción por su presencia aquí. Great emotion y to have you here. Thank you very much. Cuando le dieron el, el premio Princesa Asturias en 2016, el jurado habló de, de su obra como una ética, una épica, perdón, épica, eh, minimalista when e irónica. The, eh, no sé si está de acuerdo con esa descripción. When you get the uh, Princess of Asturias uh, prize, the jury told about an ethic and a, of an epic, eh, right? Minimalista, sí. A minimal, minimalism. Sí, Are bueno, you okay. agree with that uh, description? No, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> They gave me the prize anyway. <laughs> Uh, I don't think the king cared, <laughs> but, I, but I, will, I will just say this about minimalism, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it gets to be one of those words that are, that, that are fetishes, um, and um, the reason I, I don't like it is that, and let's not talk so much about me, let's talk about Raymond Carver. Raymond Carver was said to be a great minimalist yes. writer, he was. but I know for a fact that he tried to fill those stories up as densely and as richly as he could. He wanted to put everything he could that belonged in the story into the story. Uh, he, he, he wasn't trying to take away from the corpus of the story. He was trying to fill it. And for me, writing novels, I, I think I'm a maximalist, which is to say that I, I, I think... Um, that the reason readers read fiction is to encounter well-chosen words because that's, the, that's where you contact the story first. Even before the word begins to mean anything to you, you interact with the word. And I, I love language and I came by it naturally And, and so I want to make my books have as much pleasing language in them as I can. And so I'm, I'm never trying to take away. In fact, I'm always sorry when I take something out because I want to leave everything in. Mm. So, um, but, but, you know, the truth is uh, you write books 
People read them. If they read all of them, if they read all of a book, they are entitled to say whatever they want. They are entitled to think whatever they want. And that includes the jury for the uh, Asturias Prize. If they want to say minimalist, yes, fine. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or no matter what it is. I mean, all I want to ask you to do is read to the last word. And if you read to the last word, you are entitled to say and think whatever you please. I mean, you don't have to always say it to me. <laughs> sí, por favor. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm very happy to have you here today. Um, so am I. So are we. Thank you. <laughs> I have my kids here. I could, and you know, they came with, the, they came along. Well, that's um, very nice. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you have been drawing for the last hour. Um, I have a question. I know you've been, you taught in Ireland in Dublin in Trinity College. Yes, uh, I did. And I'd like to know what's your relationship with the city and with, with Irish literature. Well, in my, general. <clears throat> my, my relationship uh, with, with Irish literature is just, you know, having gone to college in the U.S. and, and having read Frank O'Connor and Joyce and Elizabeth Bowen, and that, that, was, that was what it was. it was. It was all of those people, uh, and, and, and Yeats. And, and so before I ever set foot on, uh, on the island of Ireland, I, I, I had this complete set of cultural certainties about it and and but and then everything that i have seen since i have been in ireland now for 35 years going uh, bears it out it all it all bears it out i mean you i mean you can get into a taxi in ireland and be be, be going uh, to phoenix park and before you get there the, the t you and the taxi driver are talking about yates <laughs> i mean it's this saturated environment with with the arts and and, and literature. I mean, there's all the other stuff too, all the bad stuff, no doubt about it. So, being privileged and fortunate enough to be a professor in Trinity, I, I just got the best of it. My God, it, you mean, it, uh, when Christina and I were just starting life, I, I wanted to get a PhD in, in Trinity, and I, I couldn't get in because I didn't have a fellowship. And you know, it's a Protestant university, so they don't pay for anything. Uh, so I didn't go. But later on, many years later, I w was a professor there. And I felt like, in a way, I had kind of circled the square. And, um, and, and knowing people in Trinity has, has allowed Christina and me to go outwards into the country, particularly into the north. We go to the north a lot. And I like the north. I, and I like the north for the very reason I like Gibraltar, which is this clash of, clash of cultures and clash of reliances and so if for, for me it's just win win to go there for, for the for the two of us yeah una pregunta más Uh, bueno, yo también me siento muy feliz de estar tan cerca de usted. Eh, ya que hemos, nos ha hablado en, en un par de ocasiones sobre el lenguaje y, de, y la traducción. You, you talk about uh, language and translation yes. several times. Y entonces, eh, cuando nos ha estado explicando la elección de las A, de las O, de las U, sí. eh, pienso que es inevitable que perdamos los que no somos capaces de leer ah. el inglés. Well, that's a very good question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure it does, yes. But I am also hopeful and in most ways confident that something will be replaced. That, that when, when something like that sensitivity to language in English is translated into German, that when necessarily those sounds aren't includable, that the translator will find something of her own or his own to substitute for it and, and, and to make the book not only as good as my book, maybe better, but also German, also Spanish, because translation is not transliteration. Translation is reimagining the book in another culture and in another language. And so I, I'm 
I am necessarily having to trust good translators, and I work with them. We talk. We talk about choosing words all the time, and uh, so I. Um, and you said to me that this is, is this is a work you enjoy a lot. Oh, very much. Um, it, it gives. It, I learn something all the time from translators, uh, and I learn what they're doing. I, I learn to respect the task that they have to undertake. So, but it's it's crucial to think that. Translators reimagine a book is what they do, using my book as a, as a kind of a blueprint. Mm. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay, better than okay. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Sí, por favor. <coughs> Dos preguntas más. <coughs> eh, no sé si usted es consciente que todos los que estamos aquí eh, guardaremos este recuerdo para siempre y lo contaremos says, una y otra y otra vez. If otra you are aware that everybody who is here will remember this moment forever. Oh. And they're going to tell it to everyone. Oh, well, wonderful. Then I've come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for this place all my life. <laughs> Just one question. When you ask life, right? Do you have anything to ask to life, being a writer, a well-known writer? Do, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing well, very well. Do, do you have something to ask, an, anything else to ask to life? I don't think I even understand that question. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not translating that well enough. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. I, he said that you're a, um, um, you're a famous writer, yeah. well-known, the people loves you, and... Uh, if there anything else you want from life? From life? More of her. <laughs> but I, I will tell you one thing, though. You know, the, the only reason for somebody such as I to come and talk to you is to make you understand that writers are human beings. And that uh, if I can do this, I want, to f I want you to feel encouraged, if you should want to do this, to do this. It's a, it's a high calling. It's a, it's, a, it's a noble enterprise. You get to do with the best of yourself something for someone else whom you never know. Dos más. Quedan dos más. Y aquí había una también. Bueno, las últimas tres, por favor, sí. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, mañana hará, hará un buen día y podrá descubrir <laughs> la belleza de, de esta ciudad y de la luz tan maravillosa que tiene. Tomorrow will be a good day and you're going to discover the light of the city. Oh, I hope so. I want to. Thank you. The beauty of the city. I, I'm very... Thank you. <risa> eh, me ha llamado mucho la atención que al principio, bueno, lo que esto, usted ha estado contando, que de, eh, con su obsesión de contar las palabras, las sílabas, los acentos, y yo pienso que eso es una obsesión de los poetas. ¿Qué, ¿Cuánto de poeta hay en usted? Mm. ¿Entiendes la pregunta? Ella dice que es asombrosa por la manera en que usted habla sobre los sonidos, y es más de un poeta. ¿Qué sort of poeta are en well, I, I would love to be able to write a poem. I can always write one line, but I can never write two lines. I, 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 I'm, so, I'm so wedded to uh, everyday life, in a way, that, um, that, that I, 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 I have the novelist's impulse to expand. And where I, whereas I think, in a way, the, the poet's impulse is, is, is to concentrate and to concentrate and to concentrate. And I, I don't, that isn't my natural bent, to concentrate like that on every line. And I think if I could do that, I couldn't do the other thing. I couldn't go outwards, which is what I am good at, going outwards. So I would love, my, my teachers were poets. My heroes, when I was a young boy, as, as writers, were all poets. So I got as much as I could from them. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Good evening. I'll, I'll try in English. OK. <laughs> Me too. Uh, 
<laughs> Again, I'm so excited of being here with you. Thank you. Um, and a big fan of you, and especially big fan of Fran Bascom. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple, of, a couple of questions, two short questions. One of them, a political question, if I may. Yes, please. <laughs> the first one is very simple. What did you write on your notebook? A notebook you, you showed. What did I write in my notebook? Yeah. And the second one, the political one, is um, are you afraid of the US elections on November? I'm terrified. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm, it, is, it, is, it is a dark subject for everybody in the country. A dark, dark subject. Because we are really people who like one side or who like the other side are terrified that the other side is going to win. And, and it's not just the people who, are Democrat, who will be voting Democrats. It's the people who are voting Republican. They're afraid we'll win. We're afraid they'll win. And I, 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 am, fearf I am fearful. I am really fearful. Um, and what I wrote in my notebook, I, I, you mean today? All, all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. What do, you, what do you use your notebook for? Um, Let's see. I can find something juicy here. Uh, no, that's not any good. See, a lot of these things are just boring. It's, I mean, to, I'm trying to write a little essay about time. You don't want to hear about that. I guarantee you. I, you know, um, let's see. Oh, the, okay, you, 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 this is, a, this is a, my, my, my little story about the man who goes to see the dying man. I, I decided to make him be the dean of a little college. And um, there are reasons for that. And, um, and, and so I'm trying to think what kind of drama can be going on in his life that would be worth telling about. And one of the things was, might be, that he's afraid of losing his job, okay, as the dean. And so my line that I wrote in my notebook at breakfast yesterday was, <laughs> okay, I apologize for this in advance, okay. He was thinking and feeling that he might lose his post and be cast back amongst them, which is to say, his colleagues. Uh, uh, one can leave, but you can't go back. Which is just about American academic life, which is to say people become deans in American colleges because they're pretty much failures as scholars. And, um, and so once they, <laughs> once they become deans, the thing that they're terrified of is that they will have to go back in the college and teach again. This is obviously a, a comic novel I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so what he's afraid of, what he's afraid of, is that he will, that he was so bad at being dean, that he'll have to go back and start teaching again, and that is just worse than the worst fear of all. So, so all right, uh, that's what I wrote in my notebook. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's not as it's not as interesting as I just made it sound. <laughs> Please. Last one. Bueno, hola. Great. Mi pregunta es mucho más prosaica, mucho más simple. ¿Qué lee Richard Ford? ¿Qué última obra o qué último autor le llama la atención, le ha conmovido o cuál recomendaría? Obra o What are you currently reading? Uh, which what, what am I reading? Well, what you can recommend us? Uh, well, Christina and I just read a book. You know, I get sent, people send me books. And, and they want me to recommend them back to the world. Um, and so I... Most books aren't very good. Why should they be? You know, why should most books be very good? It just doesn't stand to reason. This book was really good, and it's called Wolf at the Table. And it's be published in the U.S. in English now, now. And it's by a man named Adam Rapp, R-A-P-P, -P, who is a playwright, 
and it's a long, well, not terribly long, it's 400 pages in English, and it's, it's just very good. Um, it's, it's, it's dark, it's, 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 it's funny once in a while, not very much, but it's, it's, it's riveting book. And then I'm reading a, a man who's a friend of mine who runs a little institute in, in Naples, asked me if I would write a little essay about time. And, and so I've been reading these very uh, complicated, recondite books about time, which are very boring. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like if I immerse myself in it, I will, th I will think something myself which is worth writing about. Yeah. So let me finish, uh, Richard, with a declaration. A declaration of love, friendship, and gratitude for your books and your words. For you and Christina, for these days of wisdom, kindness, and warmth, I hope you leave Andalusia with an impression as deep as you cause on us. Thank you. We try, all of us, we try. Yeah. Thank you. Escribidor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.